I, I think you all know that, that Human Rights Watch is an independent international organization. We work in about 90 countries around the world. And most of the time, we issue reports, you know, one country at a time or one issue at a time. But each year, we, we put out a, a global report, what we call our world report, where we look at the entire world. And um, this report has individual chapters on, a, on each of those 90 countries. And it also includes um, several essays looking at overarching issues, including one that I traditionally author looking at um, the big global trend of the prior year. Um, this is our 25th world report, so we've been doing this for a while. And the issue that we've seen over the last year is one um, in response to what clearly is you know, a, a more tumultuous world, one presenting very severe security threats. And we found that governments almost instinctively, when confronting security threats of the sort that is, say, typified by, by the terrible atrocities of ISIS or the Islamic State, governments tend to fall back almost reflexively on a pure security approach that ignores the role of human rights. Um, governments tend to see human rights as a luxury for less tumultuous times, something that can be dispensed with when the going gets tough. We see that not only as wrong as a matter of moral principle, you know, wrong as a matter of international law, but also short-sighted and counterproductive. And what we found as we surveyed the world over the last year is that uh, the failure to respect human rights in addressing the serious security threats confronting the world today fails to get at the root causes that gave rise to many of these threats and also leads governments in a, a direction that will be unsuccessful in trying to confront those threats. So let me this morning give a few illustrations of this observation. Um, Nadim, will, as he mentioned, will then talk about Lebanon more specifically and will then open it up for your questions. But I think the, this tendency to ignore human rights um, aggravating rather than solving security problems is best illustrated by Iraq. Um, it was just a few years ago that ISIS's predecessor in Iraq, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, was defeated in significant part with the help of the Sunni tribes that rallied together to combat Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Since then, we saw emerge in Baghdad a highly abusive sectarian government, the government of former Prime Minister Maliki, which um, relied very heavily on Shia militia that were epitomized by, um, by their torture, their detention, um, their disappearance, and their execution of large numbers of Sunnis. And this sectarian abusive force operating um, very much with the authorization of Baghdad made it so many of the Sunni tribes rationally calculated that they were safer under ISIS of all things rather than continuing to risk existence under the Shia militia. Uh, and that is why you know, ISIS suddenly rose because many of these Sunni tribes that had been combating its predecessor were suddenly either neutral or even joining with ISIS against Baghdad. Um, clearly, to solve the serious ISIS problem in Iraq, it's going to take reining in the Shia militia. And Prime Minister Abadi has um, talked a good game so far. He has talked about an inclusive Iraq. But he has not um, been willing or arguably able to rein in the Shia militia, with the result that many of the Sunni tribes still are hedging their bet um, and not turning against ISIS because they don't feel that they have a place in today's Iraq. Um, solving the ISIS problem is going to require a government in Baghdad that is going to be, make it possible for all Iraqis, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of sect, to feel that they can be safe and secure with their rights respected in a future Iraq. If you look next door at Syria, 
Um, there obviously were a number of factors behind ISIS's rise in Syria, including significant funding from the Gulf, um, a very porous border with Turkey. But one big factor in ISIS's rise were the atrocities of the Assad government, um, illustrated foremost by the barrel bomb. Um, these, these weapons, you know, basically crude weapons, large oil drums filled with explosives and metal fragments, are so imprecise that they cannot be dropped near the front lines for fear of falling on, on Syrian military troops. These are weapons that have no practical military utility. They are designed simply to be dumped over civilian neighborhoods, hitting schools, hospitals, civilian institutions, and as many civilians as possible. Ending these barrel bomb attacks is the single most important thing that could be done to stop the slaughter of civilians in Syria today. But so far, the Western response is focused only on ISIS. Since the effort to rein in Assad's chemical weapons, there has been no comparable effort to rein in his slaughter of civilians by conventional means, particularly by the barrel bomb. And it is going to be extraordinarily difficult to convince Syrians to fight ISIS atrocities while ignoring Assad's atrocities. Um, a much more equal-handed effort focused on the killing by both sides is going to be necessary if the effort to rein in ISIS is going to succeed. Looking elsewhere in the region, if we look at Egypt, the West has rallied around general, now President al-Sisi, despite the fact that he is presiding over the most intense period of repression in modern Egyptian history. This is illustrated by the, the Raba Square Massacre, the slaughter in the course of about 12 hours of a minimum of 817 Muslim Brotherhood sit-in protesters. Since then, the Sisi government has detained tens of thousands of Muslim Brotherhood members and other perceived opponents and critics. Torture is pervasive, due process violations are common, and we've even seen the mass handing out of death sentences. Despite this severe repression, it seems like people are racing to become Sisi's best friend. And the argument is always, oh, well, you know, we need Sisi to meet the serious security problems in the region. He's helping contain the war in Gaza, He's fighting an insurgency in the Sinai. He's keeping the Suez Canal open. We can't afford to, to criticize him because he's such an important security ally. But think about the message that this is sending in the effort to combat ISIS or others who are resorting to violence. Because the message coming out of Egypt today is that if you believe in politics informed by Islam, don't bother with the ballot box. Because even if you win an election, your government will be overthrown with barely a peep of protest from the international community. And you can imagine how that sells with ISIS. It basically is sending the message that there's no point in trying the ballot box. Violence is the only real option if you believe in government informed by Islamic principles. That is a disastrous ideological message to be sending to a world that faces such a severe threat as that posed by ISIS. Let me move next door and, and, and look at um, Israel and Palestine. Um, this last year, we obviously saw, saw yet another war in Gaza um, with um, Israel killing up to 1,500 civilians um, with, a, um, with its massive air power. Um, flip side of that, we saw Hamas launching many, many rockets toward Israeli populated areas and we saw a continuation of the settlement expansion. Now, in this context of abuse, you would think that the international community would applaud the fact that Palestine has finally joined the International Criminal Court. Um, you know, what this represents is a willingness, not simply by the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, but also by Hamas, which had to sign off on this, this decision, to be willing to abide by the rule of law. Um, Hamas is basically saying that from now on we recognize that our rocket attacks are subject to ICC prosecution. Um, that should be a positive development. But all we've seen 
is protests from the West and actually the threat of sanctions even. Now, the arguments put forward by the West, you know, none of them carry water. Some say, oh, this is just another UN agency that's going to discriminate against Israel. But the ICC is led by a professional prosecutor, not a, not a bunch of governments that will, will tend toward politicized decisions. Many say, oh, this might impede the peace process. But we've known what a likely settlement in Israel and Palestine is going to be for a long time. The issue is how do you get to the trust so that the two sides can agree? And the biggest impediment to that trust are the ongoing war crimes. Uh, we're never going to get a peace plan so long as the settlements are being expanded, Israel's periodically bombing Gaza, and Hamas is sending rockets into Israel. Deterring these kinds of war crimes, which is what the ICC has the prospect of doing, is the best way to build the trust needed to enhance the peace process. But you'd never know that from the international community's response. Um, their preoccupation with preventing any Israeli from being brought to The Hague is not the best thing for the people of Israel, certainly not the best thing for the Palestinians, and far from the best thing for the cause of international justice. Again, it's a very short-sighted response um, in, in response to a particular security threat um, where it's been a mistake to abandon human rights principles. Now, we find similar problems as we look around the world. In Nigeria, um, the Nigerian military is fighting Boko Haram, which in many ways presents an ISIS-type threat in northeastern Nigeria. Um, but it's doing it in a classically corrupt, abusive way. And when it enters a town and burns down 2,000 dwellings, or when it summarily executes large number of prisoners, this naturally builds animosity that makes it much harder to win the hearts, minds, and cooperation of the local population, an absolutely essential step to reigning in Boko Haram. If we look in um, Russia and Ukraine, and the conflict in eastern Ukraine. The West essentially ignored Putin's intensifying crackdown over the last two years, figuring it just had more important things to do with Russia. You know, Russia was a supposed partner in peace in Syria. Russia was needed to get a nuclear deal in Iran. And as a result, there was very little pressure on Putin to stop this intensifying crackdown. The result of that is that Putin was able to build a closed information system in Russia, where he and his allies totally dominate the airwaves and the ways in which most Russians obtain information. That one-dimensional information system made, it, made Putin's initial adventurism in Ukraine possible and has made it possible to this day for him to be enormously popular in Russia because most Russians only see a propagandistic, one-dimensional view of the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Um, addressing that security threat is going to require paying attention um, to the human rights problems in Russia as well as in eastern Ukraine um, in order for dissident voices and critics of, this, of Putin's adventurism to finally be heard. Now, the last example that I'll give is, is from the United States. Because there we saw, um, after September 11th, 2001, uh, the systematic use of torture in response to a security threat. And this last year, um, that torture was, um, was spotlighted through a report from the US Senate Intelligence Committee, which described in, in incredible detail um, not only the use of torture, but also its, its use beyond anything that was authorized and its complete counterproductiveness. The fact that despite the CIA claims, um, little if any useful intelligence was gathered from the torture. Because obviously people say whatever the torturer wants rather than, than revealing accurate information. The disappointing thing is that while President Obama himself has ended the torture, he has steadfastly refused to prosecute the torturers. He hasn't wanted to pay the political price needed to launch those prosecutions. He hasn't wanted to antagonize the intelligence agencies. And he has um, argued, or his, his administration has argued, that it would be unfair to prosecute the torturers because the torturers were smart enough to get the Bush Justice Department to issue a twisted legal opinion 
authorizing the torture. Um, even though we now learn from the Senate report that the CIA knew it was torturing, it knew it was illegal, and it went shopping around for pliant lawyers in the Justice Department to issue them their legal excuse, um, making these lawyers not independent judge judges of the torture, but actually accomplices in that torture. But despite this, Obama to this day refuses to prosecute. And the sad consequence of that refusal is that torture, in a sense, remains a policy option in the United States. Future presidents will see that there may well be law against torture. There are treaties the US has ratified against torture. But they will see that there was no penal price to be paid for the use of torture, which is simply going to make it much more likely for some future president to resume the torture option. So Human Rights Watch is continuing to put intense pressure on the US government to prosecute the Bush CIA torturers um, before this precedent of impunity is allowed to stand. So let me just conclude by saying that we've, um, we see that many governments around the world in times of serious security threats view human rights as a luxury, as an unnecessary restraint, something that ties their hands in going after serious security problems. That's wrong as a matter of law. It's wrong as a matter of moral principle. And what we see time and time again is that it's wrong as a matter of strategy as well. It doesn't make us safer. It doesn't make us allow us to confront security challenges more effectively. And what we urge governments to do in, in this year's Human Rights Watch World Report is to view human rights not as some kind of arbitrary restraint, but rather as a reflection of fundamental moral values that are rarely worth the price of abandoning. Rather than, than seeing them as an obstacle, human rights should be seen as a moral guide, even in difficult, challenging times. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> I just would like to add a few remarks on human rights in Lebanon over the past year. 2014 saw a deterioration of the security situation in the country. We witnessed car bombs, clashes in Tripoli, and spillover violence from Syria into border towns, notably Arsal. This deteriorating security situation and the government response to it had an overall negative effect on human rights in the country. Two areas of concern stand out for us. First, the new restrictions that have been imposed on refugees fleeing from Syria. And secondly, the ongoing ill treatment, torture, and other due process violations by security forces, particularly during security operations. In addition to these two crisis-related concerns, we saw Lebanese democratic institutions falter as parliament failed to elect a president and also parliamentary elections were postponed yet again, this time until 2017. This meant that the many needed reforms in this country and many draft laws are still waiting in the drawers of parliament. Draft laws to stop torture, draft laws to improve the treatment of migrant domestic workers, laws to enact an optional civil code for Lebanese, or even to set up a commission to investigate the fate of those who disappeared during Lebanon's civil war. The only positive advance over the year was the adoption of a law to protect women from domestic violence. It's an important law, it has many flaws, but it is a step forward. And the enactment of this law, really a success of civil society, shows that sustained lobbying in this country can still lead to results. Now let me just talk a bit more in detail about the new restrictions that we have seen on refugees from Syria. We know that more than 1.1 million Syrian refugees are currently registered with UNHCR. We appreciate the great burden that this influx of refugees has imposed on Lebanon, 
And we also know that the international support, while important, remains inadequate given the size of the challenges. At the same time, we continue to document over the year restrictions and violations affecting Syrian refugees, but also, for example, Palestinian refugees from Syria. Firstly, the new restrictions at the border. We saw the Lebanese government implementing since May new regulations to prevent Palestinians from Syria to enter the country. In October, the cabinet decided to impose similar restrictions on all Syrians, and we finally saw on December 31st new regulations enter into force that restrict the ability of Syrians to enter Lebanon. In practice, these new regulations will deny entry to many people fleeing Syria on account of real threats to their lives and freedoms. As such, these new regulations are incompatible with Lebanon's obligations under customary international law of no refoulement, basically the idea that you cannot reject at the border anyone whose life or freedom would be threatened in Syria. In addition to these new restrictions at the border, we are also concerned about the ability of refugees already in Lebanon to renew their residencies, in part because renewal fees may be prohibitively expensive. Right now they are $200 per person per six months. So this is pushing a lot of Syrians to fall out of status. And not only is this bad for the rights of these refugees, we would argue that it's also counterproductive because it is pushing a lot of people underground, people that would not represent any security threat to the country. And finally, during the year, we documented increasing retaliatory measures against Syrian refugees, from municipal curfews, forced evictions by landlords, and even violence by private parties with little response from Lebanese authorities. Just to give you an example, in August and September, we documented 11 violent attacks with knives and guns against unarmed Syrians. And almost all the victims said that they were too afraid to go see the Lebanese authorities to even file a complaint. Our main recommendation to the Lebanese government is to honor the principle of non refoulement and not forcibly return or reject at the border any person whose life or freedom would be threatened. And if the December 31st regulations are not going to be rescinded, then at least we would argue that the current criteria need to be expanded, particularly the criteria for humanitarian admission, so that all those who would be deemed under the international definition of refugee to qualify as a refugee to allow them to enter into the country. We recognize, I mean, that the issue cannot just be resolved by Lebanon, and this is why we have and will continue to advocate with the international community and with other international uh, and with other border countries, uh, countries neighboring Syria, to keep their borders open and to continue support for countries like Lebanon. The second issue is the issue of ill treatment, torture, and due process violations in security operations. The ongoing car bombings in the country, but also the inc increasing strength of ISIS and Nusra in border areas, have led to a security crackdown, particularly against people who are suspected of being Islamists, or even many Syrian uh, gathering places because of the fear that there may be security suspects. We have documented a number of grave violations by the security forces, including the army, in their crackdown. We know that the most intensive clashes happen in Arsal. During that fighting, we documented cases where the Lebanese army prevented Syrian civilians, so Syrian refugees, from leaving the town during the fighting. We've also documented indiscriminate fire by all fighting parties, including the Lebanese army, on refugee settlements. According to a field hospital in Arsal, 489 people were wounded and at least 59 civilians 44 Syrians and 15 Arsal residents, natives, were killed in the fighting. We know that during the fighting, 35 security personnel were taken as hostages and four of them were executed. We condemn those as war crimes, taking hostages and extrajudicial executions. But in addition to violations during security operations, we also documented arbitrary arrest, ill treatment and torture during security raids in the Bekaa and in Tripoli. Several Syrians and Lebanese told us they were ill-treated or tortured at checkpoints or during interrogation by the military or military intelligence. 
The type of ill treatment and torture that we documented included severe whippings, beatings, sticks, cigarettes, batons, electricity, and often the butt of the rifles of the soldiers. The problem of torture in Lebanon is not new. On October 2nd, the UN Committee Against Torture issued a report on Lebanon that concluded that torture in Lebanon is a pervasive practice that is routinely used by the armed forces and law enforcement agencies. Our main recommendations to the Lebanese authorities to turn the page on these abuses is one, to establish a national preventive mechanism, so basically a national institution that can visit and monitor detention facilities as required by the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture, which Lebanon ratified in 2008. And which, by the way, a draft law is also sitting in Parliament. Secondly, we need to see independent investigation for reports of abuse, and those responsible, regardless of who they are, should be held to account. We also hope to see more transparency from the Lebanese army. After incidents of torture are reported, we often get reports from the army that they are investigating. But there's never any real accounting of what happened with these investigations and if anyone is held to account. Respecting the rights of suspect is not only the right thing to do, but it's also the best way to ease the tensions in the country and ensure a way forward. Finally, before I conclude, I just want to briefly highlight some additional issues that we spotlight in our chapter. These issues are long-standing in Lebanon. Officials often tell us now is not the time to address them. Yet, these issues cannot wait until Lebanon resolves all its political crisis to address. Issues such as discrimination against women. We just released a report earlier this month showing how Lebanon's 15 separate personal status laws discriminate against women and how the religious courts in their rulings are affecting women in the most basic elements of their lives such as custody of their children after separation such as access to divorce or even in the financial impact of any separation with their spouses. Another issue which is again and again a point that we talk about every year, the treatment of migrant domestic workers. They are still excluded from the labor law, they're still subject to immigration rules uh, in the kafala system that make them more prone to abuse and we are still seeing too few prosecutions and oversight in terms of how they're being treated by their employers. And finally, addressing the past, a key issue in this country. There are different proposals on the table right now to investigate the fate of the disappeared during the Lebanese Civil War. And yet, no action by government or parliament was taken this past year. In conclusion, as Ken mentioned, for Lebanese officials looking for a solution to the myriad problems and challenges facing the country, human rights can and should serve as a roadmap. They are not a luxury, not an issue to be dealt with when the time is good. Rather, it's an issue to deal with, us, to deal with today to ensure that we actually reduce some of the challenges and reduce the abuses that we are seeing on a daily basis in our country. Thank you very much. Okay, um, both Nadim and I would welcome your questions. Yes. Oh. Hi, my, um, my question is actually to Nadim. Mm -hmm. I was a couple of weeks ago in Tripoli and I was uh, spending time with many of the Islamists there. And from my, what I understood from them that is there are a lot of arrests that sometimes are not warranted that are happening in Tripoli. And uh, I'd like to know if uh, Nadim can confirm that, if he knows how long these people are arrested for. And because a lot of times these people are arrested because they have pictures of Nusra, not necessarily do they support Nusra, or they've downloaded uh, rebel uh, websites. So can you confirm that and do you know how long these people are held? Um, sorry, my name is Mona Alami, I'm a freelance journalist. Do you want to do multiple questions or one to one? To one, to one, to one. Okay. Um, yes, this is an issue that we have been documenting. A lot of uh, these people are being arrested by the army or military intelligence or military police, subject to basically someone informing on them or some sort of notice. Uh, um, so no warrant is being issued. A number of them told us that they did not know why they were arrested. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of time that they're being held, uh, most of the cases we've documented spend between five days to 15 days in, uh, in custody without any charge being brought forward, which is a violation of Lebanese law, which basically says you have to be brought before a judge within 48 hours or potentially after, you know, this period can be renewed once, so a maximum of four days. But yes, this is, this is a common practice that we are documenting, that we will be releasing a report on in April on these various abuses, and that we have highlighted to uh, Lebanese authorities. The best way to counter that is to create this national institution that can go and visit all places of detention, including places of detention uh, used by the army. Hello, I'm Susanna Samham from the Spanish uh, News Agency EFE. This, my question is to Mr. Kenneth. I would like to know which is the situation in Latin America and uh, which are the main problems you have detected in, in this region? Thank you. Well, the, the issue that we highlighted in, in the report was Mexico, which you know, I, I think um, demonstrates this problem of ignoring rights in the name of security and having that be a, a counterproductive approach. Uh, you know, we all know that Mexico, very much at the urging of the U.S. government, has been engaged in a so-called war on drugs. And this past um, fall, we saw one manifestation of that, which was the um, disappearance, really the killing, of 43 young students who happened to cross a local official who was in league with the drug cartels. And because Mexico has been so focused on using a military approach to fighting the cartels, it has allowed a system of impunity to exist with very little, if any, accountability for atrocities committed not only by the cartels, but also by uh, the military and the police, that you get a local official who feels that if there are 43 students who are protesting, he can simply hand them over to the cartel to be killed. Um, and so I think the, the challenge for Mexico is to move beyond this atrocity approach to drugs. Um, Human Rights Watch actually believes that um, the best approach would be one that um, decriminalizes drugs, um, that undermines the market that allows the drug cartels to thrive. Um, and using an approach like that, we feel, is going to be far more effective than continuing to use um, torture and disappearance. As, as a key component of the so-called war on drugs. Thank you. I'm Ayman Mahanna, head of the Samir Kassir Foundation, a freedom, uh, sorry, a freedom of expression organizations working regionally. My question is about a human rights position on the issue of privacy, invasion of privacy by public authorities specifically. Is it something that you are following? And what's your position on it when it comes to Western countries? But also we know that in our region, um, our police forces are receiving trainings and software from their Western counterparts under the idea of fighting terrorism and infiltrating terror groups, but at the same time there is absolutely no legal standard for the use of this software and so many cases of journalists, bloggers and private individuals who, whose privacy was completely um, invaded by authorities under so many different uh, pretexts. So what's your position on this? Thank you. I mean, Human Rights Watch has been doing a lot of work countering the approach epitomized by the NSA in the United States, which, you know, as you all know, has, um, as, as revealed by Edward Snowden, has massively been invading our privacy. And there are two key rationalizations behind that approach. The first is the view that none of us has any privacy interest in our metadata. You know, all the stuff stored in your phone, you have no privacy interest in that. The reason the US government gives is because I shared this information with the phone company or the internet company. And having shared it with that company, I can't claim a right of privacy against the government. That's a crazy theory. You know, and, and even the US Supreme Court, which was the author of that theory, is backing away from it. Obama seems to be backing away from it a bit as well, but that still is the law. And governments around the world are using that you know, sharing rationale to simply scoop up everything in my phone and on all your phones, um, saying we have no privacy in that metadata. So that's one thing that needs to be changed. 
The, the other thing is that the U.S. government takes the view that the right to privacy does not extend extraterritorially. That is, it recognizes a right to privacy for U.S. citizens. It recognizes a right to privacy for non-U.S. citizens in the United States. But anybody in this room who's not a U.S. citizen, its view is that it can listen to your phone calls, the content of your phone calls. It can read your emails without impediment, that the right to privacy does not protect you. Now, that also is a theory completely at odds with what most people think. And there's a, a serious effort underway at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, led by Germany and Brazil, which Human Rights Watch very much supports, um, making clear that the right to privacy should be global and that governments should not be able to do to people outside of their territory what they're not allowed to do to people inside their territory. So these are, are big issues. Um, the battle's underway, but those are the two key rationalizations for massive invasions of our privacy, which we need to change. If I can just add something as well, Ken, there is also the issue of transfer of technology uh, and by companies to abusive governments, which is also an issue we've been working on. Uh, in Libya, uh, some of our researchers happened to find some of the documents and evidence indicating European companies that have sold technology to the uh, Gaddafi government at the time. And there are, you know, we're in partnership with other groups in Europe and others. In some cases, they, these groups are bringing lawsuits against these companies. And there are now efforts to develop guidelines at the European Union in terms of which, uh, you know, the same way there are rules about transferring weapons, that there should be rules about transferring uh, such technology. We've done a lot of work, not just on the Middle East, but also on Ethiopia and other uh, countries that are using these technologies uh, to listen to people, but also to arrest them, and in some cases, to torture them. Dalal Mawad, LBCI. I have two questions for Nadim. Uh, did you look into the, the case of the raid into uh, Rumi's prison uh, two weeks ago? I, I can't remember. We got a lot of reports that uh, abuses were, were made during that raid, not just against the Islamist prisoners, but also people who have no uh, relation to those Islamist people, stripped naked for days. Uh, they stayed without food. Mothers who I've spoken to were really worried. Did you look into that and what's your take on that? And the second question is regarding the new labor restrictions by the Ministry of Labor who've affected the domestic uh, workers in, uh, in Lebanon. We've heard of many cases uh, where people could not renew their, uh, their permit and have to leave after spending uh, 12 and 15 years in, uh, in Lebanon. Thank you. Regarding the first question, uh, we have not yet received any independent confirmation of what happened during the raid on Block B in Rumier. Uh, we are hoping to look into it, uh, but we don't have right now any information to communicate. But I think this issue raises the, the broader concern about what is happening in our prisons today. Uh, and again, what is needed is not simply to say the Lebanese state has managed to retake control of Block B. What we need to hear is what is the real reform plan for prisons, not just in terms of building new facilities, we recognize that it's needed to have better facilities, but also in terms of who oversees what happens inside the prisons and what do we do about the almost 70% of detainees in prisons who have not yet been convicted and they're just waiting for trial. So really, this is, this is an, the broader issue of prisons is a big concern and we do hope to get more information about what happened in the raid on Block B. On your second point, yes, this is an issue that we have been following uh, closely over the year. Specifically, as you know, m most migrant domestic workers in Lebanon come on what is called a Category 4 uh, work permit, which does not allow them to bring with them or to sponsor their family members. Now, a number of these domestic workers uh, who've actually been legal for their entire stay in Lebanon for many, many years have had children in Lebanon. You know, you can't stop people from loving each other or stop people from having children. They've had children, and many of these children are, were born in Lebanon, have only known Lebanon, have only gone to school in Lebanon, and suddenly this past summer, we saw that general security was refusing to renew their permits. They were getting their permits basically because they were registered in school in Lebanon. And this has led many families, uh, uh, many children to be denied a renewal of their residency, and many times their mothers have also been denied their residency, and they have been uh, told to, to, leave the, uh, Lebanese, to leave Lebanese territories. Uh, 
We've, uh, you know, we've issued a press release on it. We've written to general security. We are hoping to, to meet with them to get them to uh, amend that policy uh, and go back on the measures they have taken because this policy is violating some basic international rights, including the right of children to stay with their family uh, and family cohesion in general. Asamrua Associated Press. Uh, is the situation in Iraq currently better under Prime Minister Abadi compared to uh, Prime Minister Al Maliki? And uh, regarding Syria, uh, you spoke about the barrel bombs. Uh, we're not hearing much about the barrel bombs these days. The main focus is on ISIS. Do you see that this helped Assad and what should be done to get more attention to uh, regime atrocities? Well, in terms of Iraq, I think the, um, there's been a, a positive change in the rhetoric. You know, Abadi speaks much more inclusively about all Iraqis having rights within the country than Maliki did. Um, in terms of implementing that rhetoric, we haven't seen a lot. I think the most positive thing is that um, Abadi does seem to have made some progress in reining in the Iraqi Air Force, which had been indiscriminately bombing Sunni cities like Fallujah. And that seems to be curtailed, you know, maybe not completely stopped, but, but less of that. Um, he is addressing the detention question. He, he purports that he plans by the end of February to set up some kind of central registry for all detainees so people don't disappear. It remains to be seen whether he can do that. But the big problem of the Shia militia has not been solved. Um, and the Shia militia continue to operate they continue to go into Sunni villages and basically treat everybody in that village as an ISIS supporter and cleanse the village. Um, it's not clear how much capacity the prime minister himself has to stop that, but the international community has a lot of leverage. It's, it's throwing military hardware and assistance at Iraq and in essence is underwriting the Shia militia. So we're urging the international community to use that considerable leverage to make clear that ending the atrocities by the Shia militia um, is a precondition to ongoing security assistance and frankly a precondition to any kind of successful counterinsurgency strategy um, aimed at ISIS. In terms of Syria, you know, I think what's going on these days is the, the international community is so focused on ISIS that it has stopped looking at Assad's atrocities. And that's why we don't hear about the barrel bombs. But the barrel bombs are killing far more people than ISIS is, you know, awful as ISIS is. And I don't see how a successful strategy is going to be waged against ISIS while Assad's atrocities are ignored. Um, as I mentioned, stopping the barrel bombs has no military significance for the fight between Assad and ISIS. These are such indiscriminate weapons, they cannot be used on the front lines. They're not used to advance a particular military operation. They're simply used to dump into civilian neighborhoods and kill as many civilians as possible. The barrel bombs can be stopped without altering the balance of power between Assad and ISIS. And so we're hoping, Human Rights Watch is hoping, to persuade the international community to put pressure on Assad to stop the barrel bombs, recognizing that that's not going to impede the fight against ISIS, and indeed, if anything, it will assist that fight by making clear that the West cares about all Syrian civilians, not only Syrian civilians who are victimized by, by ISIS. Now, it's worth noting that you know, the two governments with the greatest influence over Assad are Russia and Iran. And you know, they're going to stand by Assad, but do they really want to stand by the mass slaughter of Syrian civilians using the barrel bombs? And so we appeal foremost to Tehran and Moscow to use their considerable leverage to convince the Syrian government to stop barrel bombing civilians. 